It is important to understand how the Linux boot process works. If you have a good grasp on what occurs when your Red Hat Enterprise Linux system starts up, then you will be better equipped to troubleshoot any system startup issues. We are going to briefly run through the system's boot sequence before we dive into the details of each stage. The first stage in the rel boot process is the system's BIOS initialization. Next, the BIOS calls up the bootloader for the system. After the bootloader is brought up, the first kernel image is then loaded into memory. Next, the kernel mounts the necessary file systems and starts activating the appropriate system services. And in a final stage of the system startup, the user is presented with a login screen. The BIOS, which is an acronym for Basic Input Output System, is a small program that is installed on the system's motherboard and is responsible for initializing the basic peripherals such as the keyboard, mouse, monitor, and the system clock. The BIOS is also responsible for searching for the boot device that gets the operating system started. Once the BIOS detects the boot device, it executes the program that it finds there known as the bootloader. The default bootloader program for Red Hat Enterprise Linux is GRUB, the Grand Unified Bootloader. After GRUB starts, it searches its configuration file for the kernel that is listed as its default boot image. GRUB then hands control of the system boot up over to this kernel. After the Linux kernel gets control of the boot process from GRUB, it then detects the hardware that is installed on the system and loads its RAM file system from the system boot partition. This RAM file system contains device drivers and other important script and binary utilities that aid in the system boot process. The RAM file system file name begins with initRAMFS, then the kernel version number, followed by .img. The kernel then loads the root file system in read-only mode and then executes the init process. Init is short for the initial process, whose process identifier is always 1. After the init process is started, it runs the necessary script files in the slash etsy slash init directory. Next, the etsy init tab file is read to determine the default system run level. Once the default run level is determined, the scripts relating to this run level are then read and executed. Finally, the system displays a login screen for the user and the system is ready for use. In the following videos, we are going to look at each of these stages of the boot process in more detail. The default bootloader, GRUB, consists of two stages. The first is the small application within the master boot record or the boot sector of the hard disk. The second stage is loaded from the boot partition on your file system. This is the stage that you see when your system boots and you see the GRUB menu screen. The first stage of GRUB is created during the operating system installation. It exists in the first 446 bytes of the hard disk that contains the boot sector. The first stage is executed by the BIOS and its purpose is to find the GRUB configuration file located at bootgrubgrub.conf. Should you ever need to repair a GRUB installation, you can do so with the GRUB install command. The second stage of GRUB is located within your boot partition of your file system. If you are using LVM on your system, then the boot file system will be located on a separate partition since at this point GRUB does not support booting from an LVM partition. Let's take a look at our GRUB configuration file. At the top, we can see a notice indicating that since we have a boot partition, that GRUB was going to refer to our boot hard disk as HD0,0. If we look below that, we see that our boot disk is our slash dev slash SDA device. Next, we see a directive for our default boot stanza. The zero means that we are looking at the very first GRUB stanza to boot from. Below this, we see our timeout directive. This value is for the amount of seconds that will pass before the default entry in the grub.conf file gets booted. You can change this value to whatever you want. Let's quickly see what constitutes a grub stanza. Each stanza begins with the word title. We can see that our first titled stanza is for the CentOS Linux installation, followed by the kernel version number. Below this, we see which hard disk we will boot from. Next, we have our kernel line, showing the file name of the kernel, followed by all of the kernel options that our system will use to boot with. The last line of the stanza is where our initial RAM disk file is located. 
This is the file that the kernel uses at boot time to load device drivers and initial scripts that are used to start the system up. Below this, we have another stanza containing another kernel version. We will reboot the system so that we can see what else we can do with Grub. Press a key to enter the Grub menu. Here we are presented with the Grub menu. These menu entries are made up from the stanzas that we just saw in the grub.conf file. We can use the arrow keys to select a different kernel to boot from. Just highlight an entry and press the Enter key. We can also edit a kernel entry from the Grub menu to modify how the system boots. Let's try this. Press the A key to modify the booting kernel's arguments. Here we can see the full line of kernel arguments that we saw in the grub.conf file for this kernel. Let's take out the arguments for RHGB, which is short for Red Hat Graphical Boot, and the quiet argument. We are doing this so that we can see all of the system messages during the system boot up that the default progress bar hides from view. Then press the enter key to boot the system. Now we can see all of the system messages from the kernel while our server boots. You can make changes like this permanent by editing the same information in the grub.conf file. Well, what if you don't want anyone else modifying the Grub menu before a system boots? You can password protect your Grub menu to prevent such modifications. To do this, we use the Grub MD5 crypt command. Then enter in the password that you want to use to protect your Grub menu. Then, take the MD5 hashed password and copy that into our grub.conf file. Enter a new line right above the first title and input the following. Then paste in your encrypted password. Save your file. And now we will reboot our system. We pressed a key to enter our Grub menu, but now we are told to press the P key to enter in a password for us to unlock the other features of Grub. Press the P key, enter in your Grub password, and press Enter. And now we can modify the kernel boot arguments. To learn more about Grub, look at the info pages for Grub itself. In this video, we will discuss Upstart, the new default system startup service. It was originally developed for the popular Ubuntu Linux distribution. Red Hat uses Upstart and RHEL 6 as the replacement for the old System V init system. The System V init system started every service that was needed in a sequential order. So if a single service took a long time to start, then the whole boot process waited on that one service to fire up. Upstart, on the other hand, looks at services and tasks as events, and only starts services as they are needed and starts the events in parallel, leading to a much faster and more efficient boot process. Init is the first process started by the kernel during the system's boot up. All other processes descend from the init process. If we look back at the output of the ps tree command, we can see the hierarchy of the processes with init being the main parent process. SBIN init is the location for the init program. This is typically not started by users on a system as the kernel handles the communications with this process. All of the main configuration files for init in the upstart system are contained within the Etsy init directory. There are some other scripts involved, but we will look at those momentarily. The main script that gets called first during the system startup is the Etsy init rcs.conf file. This script then executes the etsy rc.d rc.sysinit script. After the rc.sysinit script completes, the rc.conf script then reads in the default run level for the system from the etsy init tab file. Once the default run level is determined, rcs.conf then switches the system to that run level.
The Etsy rc.d rc.sys init script file is a bit of a workhorse. This script sets our system's hostname, starts up networking services, mounts and checks file systems, and it runs Plymouth. Plymouth provides the progress bar we see during the system bootup sequence. The rc.sys init script also sets our SC Linux enforcement mode, and it assists with sending the appropriate kernel messages to the var log dmessage log file. The Etsy init tab file has been demoted with the introduction of Upstart. The Etsy init tab file used to be the file that set up our main system features such as our terminals that were started and if the control alt delete keys would restart the system. All of this functionality has been moved to other script files within the Etsy init directory. The only thing the init tab file does now is dictate what the system's default run level is supposed to be. The Etsy init rc.conf file gets called up by the Etsy init rcs.conf file and uses the default run level that is picked up from the Etsy init tab file. The rc.conf file then uses that run level number to determine which run level scripts to start from the Etsy rc.d rcx.d directory where x is the system run level from the Etsy init tab file. Some of the other scripts that are used during the system bootup sequence are the Etsy sysconfig init script, which has some directives in it for setting the colors for the Plymouth progress bar and if the single user mode requires a password or not. We will discuss the single user mode in our run levels video. We also have the Etsy init tty.conf file, which sets up our virtual terminals that we can access with the control alt F1 through F6 keys. You may also find other minor startup scripts in the Etsy init directory, along with some startup scripts for some system services. This was a bit of a whirlwind tour through the Upstart system bootup sequence. If you want to find some more information on Upstart, I recommend taking a look at the two man pages listed here. The Upstart project page from Ubuntu, and also take a look at these script files yourself. You can learn a lot about your system's bootup sequence by just looking through the configuration and script files. In this video, we are going to discuss the various run levels on a Linux system and the differences between each one. A run level dictates what processes are going to be running on a system. This includes items such as particular networking services and what type of environment the user will be working in, whether a graphical environment or just a command line terminal. There are a total of eight different run levels. We will discuss each one in this video. You can only have one run level active at a time. You cannot have multiple run levels active at the same time. So you can't have run level 2 for one user and run level 5 for another user. And here are the different run levels. Run level 0 means that the system is shut down. Run level 1 is for the single user mode, and that single user is the root user. It is mostly used for making repairs to a system. There is no network access within run level 1. This is also the mode where you can reset the root user's password in case you forget it. If that sounds like a security nightmare to you, we will show you how to lock that down. Run level 2 is a multi-user mode, meaning that more than one person can be on the system at the same time. It is a text-based mode, so there is no graphical desktop. The one thing that run level 2 does not have is access to NFS shares, but other networking resources can be available. Run level 3 is a full multi-user mode with NFS access. All networking services are available in Run Level 3. Run Level 3 also is a text-only environment. Run Level 4 isn't used, but can be customized according to the administrator. You will most likely never use this Run Level. Run Level 5 is the Run Level that provides a full graphical desktop along with all networking services enabled. And finally, Run Level 6 is the Reboot Run Level. Don't make this the default Run Level, otherwise your system will just constantly reboot. So how do we use these different run levels? Here we can see that we have a graphical desktop environment, so we must be in run level 5. We can verify this with the run level command. And we can, in fact, see that we are in run level 5. To change to another run level, we can use the tel init command. You have to be root to use this command. Just enter in tel init and the corresponding number for the run level you wish to switch to. Then press enter. And now we are in run level 3, the multi-user mode with networking.
Now let's switch to run level 2. Let's first verify that we are in run level 2. And let's check our NFS service. And we can see that it is not running. But we do have web access. As we stated before, the Etsy init tab file is where the system's default run level is configured. And we can see that our system here is configured to automatically boot into run level 5. If you want your system to boot into run level 3 by default, just change the value here. Now we will save the file and reboot our system, and when it comes back up, it will default to run level 3. We will use the Telenet 6 to reboot our system. In our next video, we will show you how you can boot into different run levels without modifying this file, which is helpful for troubleshooting. Now that we know what the different run levels are, and how we can change to a different run level while logged into the system as the root user, we will now show you how to boot into a different run level. Here at the Grub menu, we press the A key to append an argument to our kernel boot line. Next, we will enter a 1 at the end of our line, which means that we wish to boot into run level 1. That's all there is to it. Next, press the Enter key, and our system will boot into single user mode. All we need to do to boot into another run level is to just append the number for that run level at the end of the kernel's boot arguments. And now we are in single user mode with a root prompt. In single user mode, we can change the root password in the event that we forget it. Just type in the passwd command and press enter. Then enter in a new password for the root user. Now we have a new root user password. If you would rather not have the single user mode automatically log into the root account, you can force single user mode to prompt for a password by modifying the Etsy sysconfig init file. Now scroll down to the bottom of the file and change the sbin su shell to sbin su login as indicated by the comments above this line. We get an error message stating that Vim can't write to the root user's Vim info file. That's okay since we are in single user mode, but the change to the file did take effect. And as stated, the root user will be prompted for a password the next time single user mode is run. Let's reboot our system into run level 3. Again, just press the A key, then append the number 3 to the end of the kernel boot line. So how does the system know what services to run in a particular run level? We have already used the check config tool to enable and disable services for a particular run level, so where is that information located on the system? In a moment we will find out. We have already learned that all of our service script files are located in etsy init.d. And we have also learned that our etsy init rc.conf file starts the scripts for a particular run level.
and this file in turn starts the service script files for the designated run level within Etsy RC.D. Within this directory are the parent directories for our individual run levels. Let's take a look at the scripts for run level 5 which is located in the Etsy RC.D RC5.D directory. As you can see, we have symbolic links that reference the original service script locations. For instance, we have a script file for the odd job D that links back to the original odd job D script in Etsy init.d. But what is the letter and the number for before the service name? Looking through this directory, we have the letter K and S before the service name. The K is for kill and the S is for start. The number following the letter indicates in what order a service should be started or killed. Services prefixed with a lower number get started or killed before those with a higher number. So our odd job D daemon is stopped early on in the process of entering run level 5. So what sets this priority? The check config command. Let's use an example. As you can see, the check config output confirms that the odd job D service is disabled in run level 5. So let's see what happens when we enable it. And now we see that the odd job D script link has been changed to start with an S, indicating that it will start in run level 5, towards the end of the run level 5 startup process. So now we know what check config is doing in the background to enable and disable our services for specific run levels during the system startup. Take a quick look at the directory for run level 0, the system halt run level. We can see that all service script links are stopped, except for the two scripts that actually halt the system. Take a look around these directories on your own and compare what you see to the check config list command to get a good feel for what your system does to start services when your server boots. The final topic that we wanted to go over with regards to the system startup involves the different ways that we can shut a system down. We already know that we can use the desktop environment to shut down our system. But there are a few ways of doing this from the command line as well. We have already seen that we can reboot a system with the reboot command. And now that we know the different run levels, we could even reboot our system by invoking run level 6. For shutting down the system from the command line, we have a couple of ways of doing this. We could invoke run level 0. The problem with that command is that no one is warned that the system is about to be shut off if anyone else were logged in, so someone could lose data that they haven't saved to disk yet. The better option would be to use the shutdown command. The shutdown command lets you reboot the system, shut it down, schedule a system shutdown, and you can send a message to other users logged into the system that the server is about to shut down. This gives them a chance to save any changes for their work, and if a user needs more time, you can cancel a scheduled shutdown. To schedule a reboot of your system, enter in the following. The dash R option indicates that we wish to reboot our system, and the plus 5 option states that we will have the system reboot in 5 minutes after the command is executed. And we can use the dash C option to cancel a scheduled shutdown or reboot. And as we can see from our other terminal, the shutdown has been canceled. To schedule the system to shut down at a specific time and send a notification to all logged in users, we can do the following.
and we can see in the other terminal that we got the message telling us that our system will be shut off at 11 p.m. The dash H option indicates that we want our system to halt at the time specified using the 24 hour time format. Five minutes prior to the scheduled shutdown, no new user logins will be permitted. Again, we can use the dash C option to cancel the scheduled shutdown. If you want to shut a system down immediately, you can use the word now in place of a time. This will bring the system down as soon as we press enter. And that sums up the different ways you can power off your REL system.